This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. Uh, my name is Frank Matose. I'm based here at the University of Cape Town uh, in the Center for Environmental Humanities South. I've been a scholar of um, <coughs> Commons, uh, uh, looking at uh, people and nature around protected areas in Southern Africa for a few years now. And my talk was going to uh, try and tease out some issues that I've uh, observed on the basis of the insights from work spanning many years, uh, beginning in the late 1980s, of working with states communities around uh, protected areas, especially uh, forests. And I'm going to draw on two cases where I've worked uh, for a number of years um, in these two countries of uh, South Africa, where I live now, uh, and Zimbabwe, where I am from. But uh, let me start by pointing out a few key major issues that I want to raise throughout my talk, uh, in the sense that, firstly, uh, we need to interrogate what, what does nature mean uh, when, when we look at uh, the, the state forests, the, the uh, uh, wildlife uh, protected areas, or watershed, uh, watersheds, whatever it is, what, whichever sector we want to look at. What does nature mean? I don't want to go into various uh, uh, debates about how nature is defined. But suffice to point out that uh, uh, definitions of nature are problematic and highly contested. Uh, uh, but when you look at state forests especially, uh, the idea of nature um, being separated from those who live with and use it over time creates its own challenges. And that's the point I want to uh, bring out in terms of uh, do local people have any say uh, in terms of how state forests or how nature or how they view nature? Uh, that's one issue that will become very clear in the examples that I'll come back to a bit later. And secondly, which is linked to the next uh, point that I want to raise in relation to uh, property relations. How is property defined? What is property? I mean, this is the core of the whole idea of uh, commons uh, uh, discussions uh, in terms of what does property mean? Uh, I, I think uh, Garrett Hardin obviously caused uh, a, a major challenge or has created a legacy that we're still um, grappling with in terms of uh, the assumption that privatization leads to uh, better management of resources. In other words, setting aside uh, resources or setting aside property. Uh, the argument that I'm making is that even state resources is uh, viewed as privatization from perspectives of local users. So in turn, this leads to certain benefits being derived um, by wider society. But if you have to uh, uh, situate our context or in the South, in terms of um, the state was not a neutral arbiter, but was uh, trying to set uh, a state for the benefit of a, a certain few, particularly trying to allow for capital penetration in these spaces by protecting nature. And obviously this had consequences in uh, uh, benefits that local communities, local people could derive from uh, resources that had been set aside for the state. And uh, this has its own sort of challenges. How, how then can these property relations or these benefit streams be changed to suit uh, local perceptions of property um, without romanticizing um, local people's own views in this part of the world or in other parts of the South? Uh, However, you know, the point that, I need to, uh, that needs to be brought out is that property relations set certain rights and obligations in motions, which uh, 
in which especially local people tend to lose out in terms of uh, how property is defined. They do not partake in defining how they may want to define this set of uh, relations emanating on how property is defined. And then the third point that I want to uh, raise is in terms of um, dispossession, right? Once nature is defined in certain ways, uh, which leads to property being defined in certain ways, it results in dispossession, especially as state forests are concerned or state protected areas are concerned. Uh, and this position takes uh, not just in the form of uh, material, uh, in other words, um, uh, the physical disposition that might happen in terms of the land that is lost or access to resources or resources uh, such as trees themselves and forests themselves and the wildlife that people may derive from it that is lost materially. But there are also uh, other forms of disposition which are symbolic. Uh, in other words, people may lose their lifestyle, they may lose their sense of identity associated with these spaces that have been set aside for, for state forests. Uh, and, and that also creates challenges for um, how these state forests and resources may be perceived, because it results in people being dispossessed, uh, uh, both materially and uh, metaphorically as well. And then the fourth point that I want to raise in relation to uh, what I'm going to talk about is the continuities in practices from the past um, that tends to be uh, continued in post-colonial times, which creates also its own sets of challenges in the sense that uh, how, how, do, uh, how does science interact with these spaces that have been defined as state forests or whatever, um, however nature is defined, we see continuities uh, in practices uh, in contemporary times without fundamentally challenging um, how resources or how property is viewed and conceived to take into cognizance local practices. And there's always this sort of uh, uh, patronage, uh, uh, top-down, uh, uh, marginalization of certain ways of viewing nature and looking at, uh, and, and it continues in this binary form. The other thing that is also problematic is ostensibly nature is set aside for the for its protection, but protection against who and from what. Uh, the problem usually is lies with um, uh, capital exploitation of this. Uh, highly valued resources, be they mega um, fauna or mega flora, uh, but local people are usually not necessarily engaged in these uh, forms of exploitation. So you are in literally punishing uh, people who, who are not the cause of the problems that are inherent in uh, setting aside this nature or setting aside. Um, so we need to, to, to question then the logic of what is nature, uh, how are citizens, or if they are still citizens, are treated by the state, and also raises notions about what is the state in uh, contemporary times? Has anything changed uh, in terms of the relationship between state and citizens who are treated as subjects by the state? Okay, let me move on then to and the two cases that I want to use to illustrate uh, some of these points that uh, I, I raised in my talk. I focus, or most of my work is focused on uh, a site in the north central of uh, north central Zimbabwe called uh, Mafunga Utsi, which was set aside in 1954 at the height of uh, colonial conquest of uh, Zimbabwe. It was set aside for watershed protection uh, for major rivers that were flowing into what is now uh, Lake Kariba. So the forest uh, happens to, to be in the middle of a, a communal area or where uh, local people reside. But it's, it's quite significant in the sense that people were living inside the, that forest. It is completely surrounded by 
uh, local communities. So uh, people were, were dispossessed of that uh, space to make way for state forests, uh, which then is, uh, uh, as most of you might be aware, uh, state forests in this part of the world were also um, uh, set aside to generate revenue for the state uh, with highly valuable timber. Uh, in this case, um, uh, Mukwa, a, a, a local species that is highly uh, valued for, for, for its uh, furniture making capacities. Uh, then in the 1990s, the state tried to embark on co collaborative management arrangements with the local communities to try and uh, manage these debt resources in different ways uh, with the inclusion of local communities. So uh, in other words, uh, it was the beginning of trying to restore certain access um, to, to specific, specified resources. Uh, in order to build a relations. So unfortunately, the collaborative management arrangements only uh, looked at specific uh, resources uh, that we, we could be argued to have been minor uh, and not including land and uh, trees themselves, and also excluded uh, people uh, from going back inside the forest, which was their home prior to the setting aside in the 1950s uh, during colonial times. So what happened in the Mafungaut's case uh, with the fast track land reform program in, in the early 2000s, uh, people then uh, were restored to uh, moving back inside the forest uh, on their own volition without uh, state sanction and settled themselves in their former homelands. Uh, which was not part of the arrangement, but the state had no capacity to um, uh, sort of force them back out of the forest. So as we sit right now, uh, there are many households and many families that have gone back to their original homesteads from which they had been evicted over time beginning in the 1950s uh, to the 1980s. So it's almost untenable now for the state to move people uh, to forcibly move people out who have settled themselves uh, beginning in the early 2000s uh, to go back to the middle of the forest. So, so they literally taken over uh, the forest which once uh, belonged to themselves. Uh, but on paper, um, uh, in terms of uh, property rights, it's a state forest, but now with a lot of um, uh, what is officially uh, squatting uh, inside the forest. Then quickly moving on to um, the uh, a, a, almost a similar example in South Africa in the Eastern Cape, where in Dwesakwewe, where originally this uh, forest uh, was uh, set aside for, for, for as a state forest beginning in the late uh, 1800s. Uh, in order to exploit highly valuable timber that had been identified in that part of the forest. Uh, initially, people were allowed to live, continue to live inside the forest until about 1970, uh, because uh, this forest happens to be in a uh, highly uh, uh, valued part of South Africa, which is known as the Wild Coast. Uh, so in the 1970s, people were completely removed from inside the forest um, to make way for what became a, a nature reserve uh, uh, because it also incorporates a marine protected area. So however, um, with the democratic disposition in the 1990s, people uh, started agitating to reclaim rights to their land. And uh, through formal processes, they managed to get back their rights to um, that part of uh, the forest in 2001, with a formal arrangement being made where they were supposed to get their land uh, back or their land rights back uh, in 2001. And um, uh, they began a process of formal collaborative arrangements between uh, the state and local people in managing this resource so that people could uh, derive benefits from tourism, 
uh, and other associated benefits without necessarily going back uh, inside the forest, but also forgoing the use of uh, resources such as timber uh, and marine resources that are inside the nature reserve uh, and thereby generating revenue through tourism. However, things did not go to plan um, um, for this or the other reason, uh, such that by 2010, communities began to be agitated and also uh, began to take matters into their own hands with the failure of these collaborative management arrangements, such that um, they began to uh, use resources, uh, although initially it was illegally, but the state is beginning to make inroads in trying to formalize these arrangements where people can derive benefits not just from the forest resources themselves, but also in terms of marine resources that they have depended upon for uh, generations. So in the case of um, the South African case, people were given back their land rights, but were denied access to resources that they needed for their daily uh, sustenance or daily livelihoods in lieu of the fact that they were supposed to derive benefits, economic benefits from anticipated ecotourism revenue and other uh, benefits that the state would be involved in, which didn't work. In both cases, the collaborative arrangements failed to work uh, for a variety of reasons, <coughs> which I want to point out in this case is the state ostensibly retained um, uh, authority, retained power over the governance of these particular resources um, uh, uh, instead of providing uh, full access or full rights. In the case of this bubble case, there was no restoration of land rights uh, to, 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 to that particular uh, state for it. In the case of South Africa, there was no full restoration of access to resources that are key for people's livelihoods, which also created problems and contestations by local people in taking matters into their own hands, as happened in this Bible case, where people now have self settled or formally have, uh, used squatting as means to uh, reclaim rights to their land where they now reside in any case, formally or otherwise. So, the point that uh, then can be drawn from these cases, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there are a number of points that we can return to in terms of um, uh, the meanings of nature. So what we, uh, both cases raise is that uh, fundamental issues about how nature is managed and why it should be uh, not set aside uh, in terms of meeting scientific needs, but it needs to be uh, broadened to incorporate um, local values that people have instead of uh, being perceived, perceived only in terms of its scientific benefits or, or material benefits or economic benefits that the state defines, which tends to locate um, or see nature as property, uh, which then, it then can be set aside for privatization instead of uh, looking at property in other ways in which uh, people uh, view nature as part and parcel of who they are and um, culturally and otherwise or in terms of uh, their behavior. Because uh, these spaces are highly significant for people over generations. They have their ancestral uh, graves or buried in these sites. Uh, they also uh, are maybe tied in with the traditional animist, uh, animist practices uh, involving certain uh, rituals in those spaces, but also for specific resources, which is not uh, incorporated in the way nat nature tends to be defined uh, in, in science or in uh, um, these formal arrangements. Uh, however, the other fundamental points that I want to raise is also beyond um, property and nature, is the continuities that we tend to see in uh, this paternalistic relationship or treatment of 
uh, people in these spaces as subjects rather than as citizens with the full rights in law who can make decisions about um, uh, nature and how they may want to manage or be involved in the management of these sort of spaces, which creates problems. And I think this, this, uh, this sort of spaces illustrate uh, this continued um, patronized uh, relations. In this part of the world, it's highly East, um, uh, significant or problematic that you tend to see these continuities of how uh, local people may be treated almost in racial terms or in this um, uh, uh, trying to save uh, uh, or natives from themselves, which is highly uh, problematic and needs to be challenged. Uh, at the same time, collaborative arrangements that we put in place uh, did not go far enough in dealing with the fundamental issues of access and rights, uh, which both needs to be addressed at the same time, not uh, access um, alone or, or rights uh, alone, but both end need to be, uh, to be addressed at the same time in order to deal with these forms of dispossession that have been uh, uh, practiced over time. So those are the key issues that I would like to raise uh, in relation to uh, some of the uh, two examples I've used. I could go on and raise other uh, cases from Southern Africa, but I think these two are highly illustrative of the points that I want, wanted to generate. And I think I'll, uh, I'll stop there for any questions and comments that we may generate from this discussion. Thank you. Uh, Dylan? Hi, hi. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so are you, are you, are you done with the, with the, with the discussion or do you have something else to add to it? Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll stop there. I think I'm done. Okay. Um, so I'm going to open this up to, um, to anyone who has any questions from the, from the attendees. Again, you can ask your question by, um, by typing it down in the question answer box and I will tell that to the speaker. So I'll give you 30 seconds. <clears throat> Looks like we might, I might give you some more time. Um, in the meantime, I have a question myself that I've, I've written down. Sure. So you talked a lot about these different systems and its integration um, and drawing from your experience in Southern, in southern Africa. Um, how, how important do you think is, is governmental interven intervention? Like, do you think that's a, pot a potential solution? And if so, to, to what extent are we talking about? Okay. Yeah, it's a very important question that you raise in terms of uh, government intervention. Uh, the problem with it, a government intervention itself is that it, it tends to go in a certain way in right. terms of uh, a paternalistic relationship with people in rural spaces or in these kind of spaces who are treated as subjects rather than as citizens with full rights under the law. And also the state itself tends to define these resources is a property that needs to be exercised from uh, uh, people who occupy or, or these spaces who use and see them differently. And for me, that's where the fundamental change needs to happen in terms of uh, a state, you know, if sort of um, uh, evolving itself into a different uh, uh, sort of player rather than one which is both a regulator and a, 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 an enforcer at the same time. Uh, and yet it is esteemed in some historical injustices in those same spaces. So it, it creates tensions and problems in a sense in which it is perceived by uh, local communities and how it may be an arbiter and how these resources may be used and viewed by local communities. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. and for me, that's where one issue that needs to be uh, quite fundamentally interrogated. I'm not sure how uh, the state itself can extricate itself, step back, and allow somebody to play that uh, role when, in right. fact, is the one who, with, uh, which is at the same time in charge of, um, uh, you know, uh, allowing for governance of those kind of resources. So it's a double bind, if you like. Yeah. Thank you. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to answer it. Oh, feel, feel free to ask it in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screens. I'll give it another 30 seconds. Well, from the looks of it, we can uh, we can possibly conclude this session. Um, okay. I might I might wait for another few seconds just to see if anyone else has any questions, and then I can make my concluding statements. Oh, looks like we have a question. Uh, so we have a question from Aristo, and uh, he asks, "How do you address your continuity challenge?" Okay, yeah, uh, that's a, a very important question. Yeah, how how might we address the continuity challenge? Uh, I I think there's there's a fundamental need to reorient, uh, retrain uh, state actors who are uh, responsible for managing these uh, spaces or state resources, uh, because a lot of them come also from uh, this continued patronizing attitude towards uh, local communities or towards these spaces where uh, local communities are treated as uh, subjects. So there's a fundamental reorientation that is required by state actors in order to, for them to play a, a more nuanced role uh, than what they have played thus far. At the same time, um, they need to shift in terms of, okay, uh, if, if, for example, uh, if they were to create parks or protected areas in urban areas, they would never do it in the same way that they do it in some of these rural spaces. They would be obviously consensus seeking and so on. So for me, this is where I find it highly um, significant that uh, people in these sort of spaces, you tend to see this continuity and so on, but also in terms of the attitude that the state might have towards these resources where they are seen as uh, property, where benefits can be driven. Uh, you know, uh, I'm talking material benefits instead of looking at much more ecosystem services and other values that local communities may have, which creates uh, problems for, for the state because then they see the state forest as sites for where they can generate revenue. Uh, to go into state coffers instead of seeing them as intrinsically valuable and not just for the sense of uh, revenue that may be derived from those sort of spaces or such fauna or, 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 or flora. So I, I think there's also those kind of shifts uh, in values attached to those kind of resources, not just for material benefits only. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Frank. Um, I hope that answers your question, Everista. Um, does anyone else have any last last few questions, comments? Maybe you want to get Frank's opinion on something. I'll give you thirty seconds. <laughs> 
All right. Well, I think I think I can conclude right there. Um, again, Frank, on behalf of IASC and the World Common Week organizers, I'd like to thank you for this fantastic talk and for being a part of this once in a lifetime event. Um, oh, looks like we got another question um, sure. from Nene. It says, how can we go about overcoming the use of forests as common spaces being used for political gain, pitting two communities against each other in the case of oh. man forest? Okay, how can we go about overcoming the use of forests as common Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, a very important question, you know, um, yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, the problem, the way um, uh, state forests are being managed <coughs> is, is, uh, is essentially uh, it was uh, to protect them against um, depredations, uh, depredations by uh, commercial exploiters in the first place, right? So uh, nothing has changed over time in terms of the attitudes that the state plays or um, the way these uh, uh, spaces are, uh, are retained uh, for protecting against, you know, uh, commercial exploitation. Uh, so local communities tend to find themselves in these spaces uh, by virtue of these way areas that they reside in and so on. But attitude towards local communities have not changed. And yet they are not necessarily uh, the cause of uh, major exploitation of these timber or forest resources. So again, it goes back to the issue that I was saying about how does the state perceive of this nature? How does it perceive this property? Uh, does it, is it willing to forego or, or manage uh, meaningfully with local communities and restore rights to these spaces or not? And that's a fundamental challenge for, for the state. Uh, the question that I sometimes ask is, if you were to go in the uh, developed world and set aside a, a, a protected area or a forest, whatever it is, uh, the way they would go about it would be very different from the way we have seen things happen in this part of the world, in the South, and especially in this, where we tend to see continuity in the way in this patronizing state, state citizens relationships, which are highly fraught with uh, patro uh, patronizing relations. And that needs to change fundamentally. Yeah. I see there are a few more questions here. Ah, uh, okay. It's the same question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just as closing statements, um, you know, for all the attendees, if you want to be a little bit more involved with World Commons and its applications in the real world, the IASC is uh, hosting two events, one in November, which is the first virtual conference. It's a global conference and another one in July. And this is the biannual in-person interviews or in-person conference in Lima, Peru. And if you want to apply to any of these, the deadlines are November 15th. Um, again, Frank, on behalf of the World Commons Week uh, and the organizing team, thank you so much for participating and um, being part of what I think might be like a historic event. I don't think we've ever conducted something of this stature before. Um, and of, of course, for your insightful knowledge on the topics of rights and access, especially in Southern Africa. Thank you for having me. For sure. All right. Have a lovely day. Thank you.